colleagues is to Sanang PM Sebata. I'm going to do a detailed video on Moody's. Uh, I posted a, a tweet during the w last week in reference to Moody's being a short. But uh, for this one, it's for my archives, and I'm going to put some little bit of detail. And I'll use it also as a general entry. Most of my videos, I do them and use them also as general entries mm -hmm. to track w where my thinking was. But I'm hoping those who check out this video will learn something and appreciate it. Going to the start, whenever somebody does an investment, there is more. Th there are thousands of stocks to choose from. So one has to decide which one is he getting and how do you decide which stock you take from the multitude of stocks which are available for you. And this is where the real trick comes in. How to make that choice decision. And my thinking has always been this. I'll start with the leaning to the fundamental side. On the fundamental side, you are trying to get value. Buy it when it's cheap and sell it when it's overvalued. But how do you establish that value? That's where the trick usually comes in and people get uh, intertwined in that. So in this uh, video, I'm going to unpack three things, basically. I'm going to look at uh, the comparison because trading is a business and in every business, you are looking at the cost-benefit analysis of any business which you look at it as a project that's how i approach it so for any stock which i'm going to buy whether it's for investment purposes or trading i want to make sure that when i'm buying it it's below value then i expect it to increase to where there is value or even more if i'm shorting it, it should be way above value and my expectation is for it to go down so first up is a cost-benefit analysis. That's what I'm going to deal with. And th this uh, cost-benefit uh, analysis for me is looking at uh, what is the cost of capital and what's the return percentage? How do they compare? That's my cost-benefit analysis. Then the second part is for me to look at it's not the second part, it's the order will rearrange them. But my second point is the actual intrinsic valuation or what people usually call the discounted uh, valuation to t establish the true value according to my analysis of what it is for that stock. In this case, we'll be using uh, Moody. So I want to find out from my analysis, uh, uh, intrinsic analysis, what is the actual value according to me then where is the price trading? Like you can see from this chart, this white line here represents my calculated intrinsic value and related to the story which I have to tell to come to that valuation. And as you can see, the price is actually trading way higher than the way value is. So this is a shorting candidate for me. But how do I establish the, uh, this true value? It's what I'm going to look at in this video as part two. Part three is to look at uh, what I call the optimum capital structure. Because in most cases you find companies with the debt, you don't know whether it's too much debt or too little debt and how would that debt, if it was changed, add value or destroy value. That's what most private equity guys do. And I would like to analyze that because I'm not one to be scared of leverage, but also leverage can be too much. So I always check my companies for that. I don't rely heavily on uh, somebody calculating the ratios for me because it depends what they put in their calculations to come up with that ratio. So in most cases, I prefer to do my own calculations. As an example on this one, you have return on equity here, return on assets, return on investment, but I don't know what they actually, how do they calculate this? And as an, a, a chartered management accountant, I know people can play games with this. 
there are several ways of calculating all this. It's not cast in stone how it's done. And from a management perspective, one can change one or two things, change your debt or your, your capital to, to make these numbers look crazy. And if you know that your investors are only focused on return on investment, for example, you can play around with this number. And as you will see as we go forward, this number can even be negative, yet it's appearing here as 372. Debt to equity, we have it also there. But what is it? It varies from how one calculates it. But that's what I want to look into. Th and I'm going to be using three tabs. Sorry, not three tabs. Three models. The first model which I will have here is the actual calculation of uh, the intrinsic value of the stock. Then I will have this one to calculate the optimum capital structure of uh, this company. How this capital structure is set up. Are they having too much debt, too little debt? Then the return on capital. It's taking its time to open. The return on capital, I'll, ca I'll look at return on invested capital, return on equity, and r return on equity excluding cash. Then I'll put my story together. That's how I intend to go with this company. But this is one of my favorite uh, spreadsheets, sorry, one of my favorite sites, Finviz. I like it a lot. It gives me a quick screen of what I'm looking for. I like to spend some time on this. How did I come to screen uh, uh, Moody's? I like the idea that Moody's is market cap is high. I like market caps more than 20 billion. I play options, so I want to see that it's optionable and shortable. And I like companies which really have s serious gross margin and operating margin percentages. These are the type of companies I would like to go long on. But when I'm looking in a scenario, in a market environment with where I'm thinking things are going to start crashing, I like to see these good companies which have a high beta and which are n almost on their 52-week high and some elements which I find not good enough or something which is going wrong or some way which can be the catalyst for when the market starts dropping, this thing can drop big. It has run a lot, going up 53% this year alone, year to date. But also its debt to equity looks crazy. It's 15 times debt to equity. So when things go bad, these can be real factors which can push the market down. Or oh sorry, push the stock down. Because my analysis usually starts on this page. And looking at uh, Moody's, Moody's, is, I'm going to give uh, a business model for Moody's according to me and to the story which I built. Moody's is a simple business model, and they are a monopoly. Anybody who wants rating services usually gets two quotations or two ratings from Moody's and uh, SPG. So it's basically the two which dominate the market. And they are always in business. They are real. One can say they are competitors, but uh, they are not. Re they compete against each other, but always one c a good company will need to get to both costs. So yeah, that's a simple business which they have kept a niche for themselves. If there's a deal going on, they get a share, and that's what they do. They are people-based skill, and they have their matrices for analyzing this. But uh, it's not a complicated business model, and it shows in their numbers. But to the numbers which I would like to take a look at seriously is the debt to equity, which looks crazy high. E earnings per quarter dropped by 16%, but other than that, uh, for the past the five years, it's been good. Sales growth has been good. These numbers, uh, return on assets, return on equity, and that I don't trust them that much, but they look good, especially the return on investment. It's not easy to tweak around. So these look good. Operating margin is great. I like it when it's this high. 
and it has that the target according to the analyst is higher than we is trading currently I give and take because my target is usually different from theirs so leaving this going to calculate my actual intrinsic value I'll just take you through it quickly since we're in the middle of the year uh, the year annually end year end of uh, Moody's is December so I had to use uh, the last uh, annual report and the second quarter earnings report to combine them so that's why you have the last 10k and uh, th these are just that using 12 tr uh, trailing months calculations to come up with this these are my numbers the inputs uh, yeah the list is I, I said no here yeah, because they actually using the new accounting standard which allows them to show their list operating list into their income statement and I believe they have done it right so I do not bother to make adjustment for that R&D expenses I've capitalized them that's why we have this yes there and yeah this all these figures are just inputs from the financials this is the current price when I did this evaluation effective tax rate is that marginal tax rate I've left both of them the same nothing uh, great done there the compound growth for revenue for the next five years I've left it uh, similar to what it was for the past five years according to uh, Finviz we said past five years it's been 8.4 and also when I went into my financials for this one oh boy do, 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 analysis I think it's analysis or statistics for Moody's I just took the website from the website yep check quickly but if I don't get it quick enough I'll just tell you what I'm looking for and we can move on I'm struggling a bit to get what I want I want to show you No, I'll pass it. Oh, I'm on. I'm online. Okay, Let me just do this quickly. I'm trying to show the forecast expected for growth of uh, Moody's. Sales growth. You can see revenue estimates current quarter they expected to grow by 8.9 also next year 5.5 10.9 so there is some inconsistency there but I'll stick with the 8.5 that's where I get I usually balance these numbers because I don't have that much outlook I listen to their conference call it was not telling me much I went through the script uh, transcript also I think I have it somewhere here yeah earnings webcast but it did not tell me much so I went with the analyst views there which are not that far off so that's how I came up with my 8.5 percent growth there three years to five years I gave them nine my story there is basically I expect things to stay a little bit stable yes we might have some crash in the market but that doesn't mean their business will go down because that's when there will be lots of takeovers and MA deals when the market crashes so that's why I kept it cons cons consistent there the pre-tax calculation when I did my calculation using this te uh, template I got 40.56 when I compared it with the Finviz Finviz is 39.8 so ballpark I used the uh, 40% for uh, the, the pre-tax operating margin the year of convergence 5 that's where I start playing some numbers with the difference there and yeah reinvestment uh, 
amount I used one, the calculated one for the previous year is 0.86. The industry standard in the US is 1.68, so I thought one, one is a fair number. These are the calls which I wa was making. This is where I really made some decision calls. Risk-free rate, I'm using the 10-year treasury bond, the US 10-year treasury bond, 1.7 08 something when I did this and currently just to show you it keeps changing so it's I don't give much stress to it as long as you are close enough it doesn't make a big deal in the bigger schemes you can see now we are at 1.7 I'm not going to be bothered by that and initial cost of capital this one is a tricky number and a very important one because as I said initially that when you are doing investments you want to understand what's the cost of capital. It's a really uh, fully fledged number which one has to go into the depths of the calculations. Suffice to say that um, I'll attach this spreadsheet if one is inclined to look into the details of how I do the calculations, one will have to come here and look at uh, how the operating margin, the risk premium is based on where they make their revenues and each one has different weightings and uh, risk premiums and using these calculations I come to get this one as the equity pre risk premium that's why I have it there also the better but the better yeah I was lazy I did not use the bottom up one I did not really calculate mine I just went and borrowed this one from I think it's Finviz yeah I borrowed this one from Finviz it's not that going. It's not going to make me that much difference. It's a regression one. Yeah, th there is 1.24. It won't make a big issue. Remember, valuation is just an estimate. So when I input these things and I come down here to calculate my cost cost of capital. It's a weighted cost of cap uh, capital. Oh, my spreadsheet is now to playing games. Remember, I'm giving lots of details because this is like a general entry for me. So that later on when I come back to evaluate my position, how it performed, I know wha what my thinking was. And also give some additional information for those who will work with me later to have a background of how I go about things and they have a better understanding. Cost of equity, the cost component is 9.68. Basically, you can see it here. This is the risk premium. Uh, let me just be thorough for sake what, so that we can see what I'm doing. The first part is risk free, that's B12 plus the product of. Uh, risk premium of equity and beta risk premium so it's r the 10 year treasury bond times the risk premium which we calculated from this part of where the revenue is driven from this one I multiplied with the levered beta in this case I just used the regression beta multiply that these two and add the product to the risk free rate that's the cost of capital S sorry cost of equity that's my cost of equity oh man this person is taking his time and the debt I take that debt and uh, this that's the book value of debt I convert the book value of debt to market value. So for debt, we start with that one, the book value of debt. Then I use synthetic rating to come to get the pre-tax cost of debt. Da -da 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 synthetic rating there. So I calculate the interest coverage rate. That's when I use that one. I use the 
the interest coverage rate. When I get the interest coverage rate, I come to this table to see what it corresponds to. Then I estimate that rating. And that's how I come to the estimated cost of debt of 2.6. And going back to this calc, there's my cost, pre-tax cost of debt coming from that calculation. And basically the formula That's the book value of debt. Oh, am I getting it right? This one is basically B25. Where's my B25? There's the cost of debt multiplied by that. We're just reducing it for the tax effect. And then this figure is supposed to be slightly less than the, sli slightly added to the book value. So it's supposed to be the other way around. Yeah. My book value of debt is that my cost of debt is that this is now the proportional one. But what I'm doing with this cost of debt is just re removing the tax portion, which is going to be taxed, because you get a tax benefit from having debt in your books. Then when you do the weighted weighting in the cost of capital, use those two proportions then you get 100% for all the debt. So my debt is accounts for 12.54%. Net net when I group these two, preferred stock is zero, so it doesn't count here. That's when it reduces my cost of capital down to 8.98. Debt is helping the equity cost, which is high, to come a little bit down. Basically, yeah, that's the key part there. <laughs> That's how I get my initial cost of capital. So if my initial cost of capital is about 9%, and supposing this figure was correct to be 23%, so this is the type of company you will want to invest in. Their cost is about 9%, they return about 23%. There is a good return there. It's way higher than inflation, great company. And with this operating margin is this high at 40%. And in the past, the market has rewarded them. That's great. But I have an issue here with insider transactions. They are now selling net net. So they think this is top. And I can't. I will be in the same boat with them because if the target price is about 219 and they are now hovering around 215, this is a race to get to, get to the exit door. So the, it's time for them to be getting out, which is fair. I will do the same. That's why I want to be on the short side. So with that said, and uh, using this uh, model, I did my evaluation. Ba -ba -ba. These numbers come together. And key for me is just the, uh, no man. This spreadsheet keeps jumping around. I come to an estimated value of 153.8. One can look into these figures, I will attach the spreadsheet and look at how they develop and they come up. Uh, or better still, if you want a, a detailed understanding of this, you can always uh, do go through one of those uh, online tutorials by Aswad Damadaran. He's the one who also developed this uh, modeling s spreadsheet which I'm using here. So when I, once I come to my estimated value, which is 153, that's why you will see it on this spreadsheet, on this chart. There it is. I've st stuck it there at 153. Oh no, didn't want that. So that's where my value is. The stock is currently trading there, and I'm expecting it to go down. So that's my valuation. My valuation is here at 153. The stock is at 2.15, and there is a gap, and there is the gap there. If it was to fall down, the percentage of the fallout ex as a percentage from holding that market price when I did this would be a difference of, of a move of that amount. I say that divide by the price 
if it went to where the value is, I'm expecting about 28% drop, which is very significant. If I'm using my options, I would have made more than double or tri triple of what I would really expect. So if I took it at 215, the close from yesterday, down to there, you can see from my chart, it's calculating it at 26.8. 87% that red box there you see up there it's giving me a 26.87 I'm just missing the exact details there but yeah a move of 26% down is very significant and it's not a usually different number from what I would expect in the past when we had this drop this was the October last year drop we had uh, a 30% drop when we had this drop, this was the 2015-2016 drop, we had a 32% drop. And now I'm focusing about a 28% drop, so it's within that range, and I would expect it. So that's my ana mixing my intrinsic valuation and my chart analysis, but I'll come back into the details of the chart analysis a, a little bit more. I want to go back to my other calculations. I'll start with this calculation. Most of this spreadsheet, I've linked them. So most of the tabs on this spreadsheet, you will find them not linked to these calculations, but linked to my to my evaluation spreadsheet, where I put most of my initial inputs. This one is holistic. It contains most of the information, but these ones, other ones are particular and they repeat some of the information which I would have already inputted on the evaluation spreadsheet. So looking at this one, if one would come and look at my templates, you will notice that on the inputs, there's lots of information which I'm just uh, referencing to the evaluation spreadsheet, this one. You see, once you see this formula in the spreadsheet, referring to the evaluation MCO September 19, you know that I'm copying the information, I did not re-input it. And I'll just go through these ones, which are uh, yellow but are light in color compared to the deep yellow. These are I'm actually inputting it directly. It's another template. I won't go into the details of the template, but yeah. Key. Once I populate this information, it uh, comes in and throws me the optimum. There is a, a link from Tamatra in explaining this whole template which I won't do now, it will really kill it, but if one is interested, I would always show them the way cast way it did and a full illustration of this. But what I'm getting to is the results. The ratio of the debt to capital, invested capital, it's 15%. And my calculation based on my inputs gives me an optimal of 10%. So they are carrying too much debt. They need to reduce for the optimum to get there. Because most people think that when you have more debt, you are leveraged and therefore your cost is better if you can get as much debt as possible, but that's not correct. You come to a stage where the debt causes you to your total uh, cost of capital to be less, to be more expensive because you have taken too much debt. So I always like to calculate this input, especially if I'm seeing a company which has too much debt. This debt, and for the record, most of the debt which you see people disclosing, it's actually book value of debt. It's not actually the market value of debt, which is a little bit naughty because I would rather deal with market value of debt. And just to illustrate that, on my valuation here, here is my book value of equity my book value of debt. I'll do a quick calculation there. Equity divided by, sorry, uh, is debt divided by equity. I get 10. So we have 10 times the debt compared to the equity. As you can see, it's 575 and 5,750. It's 10 times, which is not, uh, that much off to what Finviz has got here, of 15 or 14, yeah. But
but when I do my own calculations, and these things are to understand, not exactly the same thing. This is debt as a, a ratio to the debt plus equity. It's fifteen percent, and the optimal one is to be ten percent. We need ten percent debt compared to the total debt to equity, and these are at market value. The calculations you can see them there rolling up. As you can see, market value of interest bearing debt market value of equity once you calculate that the optimum one is there so I know that this is a company with which is carrying too much debt as you can see when you come down here I hope my spreadsheet doesn't play these games again you see the cost of equity cost of debt cost of capital and the value p perpetual of growth the value starts at that high when it's zero debt we come to this one, this one is about 10% of the debt. This is a, a scenario basis calculation to see where is the best value. Always the optimum debt to debt equity. At 10% we have the highest amount there, which is 40,000, 40, 40 billion. We get to 47 billion if we are at 10% or roughly around 10% there. We are down to 26% if we take it to 20 and we keep getting worse as we increase the debt the actual value calculated gets smaller and smaller so the optimum one is about 10 percent not the current uh, 15 which we are at now so if i was a, a private equity guy this one won't be one which i would be liking to come and get and uh, increase debt and buy it using debt because it's already over the over on the other side of debt, too much debt in it. But if the debt was way low and the optimum one was higher than the current, then I would be interested. But looking at the business model of uh, uh, Moody's, it's not a company which I would expect them to crash anytime soon, but they are definitely carrying too much debt. It will save my purpose when I'm expecting it to crash now because most people can start looking at this debt and get itchy especially when they see debt to equity at 15 times then lastly but not the least when I'm calculating this uh, return on invested capital I come with a f crazy figure of 109 and you'll say but uh, Finviz had it at 23 but that's the whole concept it depends how it's calculated. Key here, you notice the adjusted one. Most of the stuff is gets messed up when we look at goodwill. If you start including goodwill in these calculations, you totally get something different. Most people will include goodwill when they are cal calculating this. Let me just say no there. And show you the difference. You can see now I'm back to almost the same numbers which uh, Finviz has got. My return on invested capital is almost 29. This one is sitting at about 23. So we're close enough. But what's the difference? When I, ca when I, ca I change that, no. What I was saying is the adjusted one, I'm including all the goodwill as if it was proper debt. Let me just go into the calculations there. You see there are two figures which are completely different here. One gives me 28. When I've adjusted return on investment, I get 18. The difference is uh, goodwill. <coughs> I'll just go into the details of goodwill and give, give you a real breakdown here. The first one here, here's the formula there, let's just go. The stated capital is that one. The assets, okay, we have a B6, the tax used is the effective tax rate of 21. B16 is my invested capital. You can see on calculating this invested capital, my goodwill, I've got it at zero. Zero goodwill, that's how I'm calculating this. So I'm not including any goodwill in my cost of capital because most of that goodwill is actually a plug variance 
when these guys buy companies they overpay and they stick a number in the ba balance sheet if you include it as if it's a, a real asset you get some crazy returns like what i got there of 103 109 or so if you remove it you come to a realistic figure so for me a realistic figure there it's a this 28.92 percent and the adjusted return is 18 percent what when we talk about adjusted that's when we add back capital leases capitalized r d goodwill add back then the uh, adjusted invested capital becomes that and it's now much much smaller figure my take is i'll go with the adjusted for this one but on the same token using the same information if we try to calculate the return on equity if i don't add any goodwill return on equity becomes a very different figure the stated income still the same let me just go to this one but because the actual book value of invested capital is negative this year sorry for last year because i used the capital for last year reasoning being that the capital which they had last year is the one which produced these current returns i did not use the same capital for the same year the stated net income is for this year the capital is from last year so the capital for last year was negative then i'm getting these negative figures because goodwill is not included i've removed the goodwill then i get the negative so the return on equity becomes meaningless the adjusted one where goodwill is added back gets to 39. that's why even here you, you, you find this figure of 372 once you change one or two figures things go haywire so for returns return on investment return on cap equity you have to know what you are actually doing how it's calculated or else those figures will be truly meaningless this is the same return on equity but without you removing cash uh, this one it included cash now non-cash net income is that you can see the figure there is 319 the cash element is 12 you remove that one adjustments for R&D and that you come to an adjusted net income which is slightly higher than what we had there oh no it's smaller than what we had but this the numbers are really is that small at the top we still have negative equity so it's still giving us crazy numbers there but the adjusted one comes down but it's more than that one so it depends how you want to calculate your return on equity what is added what is not but goodwill is the real key depreciator there now just go back to the input spreadsheet and the key difference is here goodwill is generally not included in invested capital on the assumption that it is paid for growth assets do you want to stay with this assumption if you say no you have to calculate how much you remove of the goodwill and this one i, cal I removed 100 percent but i want to stay with that calculation when i'm doing my evaluation i say yes because I, I went to the accusation which they did during the year. I found most of the good which they really have in the balance sheet is just a black thing. They overpaid. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. So my real calculations for these things is this. Return on invested capital is really crazy up there. Adjusted one is also on the other side of 100. Return on equity is meaningless because of that negative capital so that's what i'll be looking at so definitely this company is very profitable from a return on invested capital basis and as a company is performing well and i'll be getting this company with the mindset that i want to benefit as it's going down and come back with it so i'll be using options and i'll stay in this company for maybe the coming three years to five years tax benefits uh, will kick in there because i'll be just ch changing my option structure but i'll always be in a position within moody's this is a long-term play uh, let me just do something quickly i mentioned the goodwill a lot there i want to come and touch on goodwill what i'm trying to do is to get to my notes of the 
on my notes when I was looking at the annual report, when I was going through the annual report for Moody's. Those are my notes in Moody's goodwill sensitive analysis. Uh, no, I don't want that one. I want the indebtedness, which is on page 122. It also appears on page 115 and on 33, but uh, the one which I want to use is 122. 10K. 122. What? I said indebtedness. Let me just check my notes again. I'm missing something. No, no, no. I want acquisitions. Page 9.4. Indebtedness is the... Uh, trying to find the weighted average uh, time when the debt g gets due. Yes. These are examples of... Uh, not examples. These are actual companies which they acquire during the year. You can see that the actual assets which they got from the company was 32 million. Property was about 4 million. Then they started their funny calculations. Just to add some, uh, some perspective here. When a deal is being done, if it's not a, an aggressive deal, or what you call a hostile deal, both parties will be interested in making the deal happen. The ones who are selling, they want to sell it for a profit. The ones which are, who are buying, if they are so much interested in buying, they will buy it for over the price. That's when the deal will happen. Because if it's a true value of the deal, the actual sellers won't have any benefit of selling. And those ones who want to buy won't be able to buy. So they always over promise. So what the accountants do is, they actually show you here in the annual report, the actual value of the assets. Then they give you some stories. This is storytelling big intangible assets customer relations they expect this to benefit for the coming 14 years weighted and they plug a number there is no science in this calculation databases five years weighted average database is basically talking about the database of clients and potential business which Riz has which they are going to acquire and they are going to benefit and they value that at 12 million could be 5 million, could be 20. It's just a black number. Product technology. The technology which they are going to acquire from this company, they have value that is going to last them 7 years and it's about 10 million. The story goes, trade name is 3.5 million. Then you add up all these funnies of theirs which they think they will benefit by taking this company. As intangible assets, they've given it a value of 103 million check this 103 million it's already about three times this uh, actual assets but still they haven't got to the actual value of what they paid I'll skip goodwill deferred tax assets they're going to benefit by 11 million taking over from the this risk which is dead then deferred revenue those are all the numbers which they are going to pay Deferred revenue and whatever, these are the liabilities they are taking over from RIS. So all in all, the liabilities which they are taking over is 58 million. Remember, they actually got assets worth 35 million, give or take. And the liabilities are about 58. So net net, they are getting more liabilities by acquiring this company. Before I put on these imaginary intangible assets. Let's give them that as is. And that the imaginary assets are real reality. They still have a problem of 186 which they could not explain. So they paid 278 million and they could not explain away 186 million. That's why they called it goodwill and plugged it in there. The explanation, they were always through their favorite word. Let me look for it. It's called synergies. They always throw it in there when they can't... Exp yeah, yeah, it is. Which is expected to extend the company's reach in new and evolving market segment as well as cost savings, synergies, expected new customer acquisitions and product. 
they've already told you about new customers there on the database customer relation they're just repeating it and making noise about it but all in all they're telling you synergies which they could not explain there i don't buy that they overpaid because they had to overpay to get the company that's all and they will tell you that usually they do annual evaluations of impairments to reduce that uh, debt which they have just assumed it's an asset when there's nothing so why am i going through this i'm trying to justify my reasoning where i said goodwill i don't want to include it as an asset it's not an access it's just overpayment this is one example they have another one here bureau of Antec. same scenario go through it you realize that they paid 3.5 billion goodwill they have it as 2.6 so they could not explain 2.6 billion of the 3.5 billion in assets and you add up the actual assets which they got and the debt which they took over you'll notice that they have more debt than that they took over about 162 million of assets and the de uh, the liabilities which they took over is 600 million already this is a bad scenario it gets worse when after they they have inputted their imaginary numbers they ca still cannot explain 2.6 billion my take when i look at goodwill is i'm looking at how much did this they overpay for this company that's what they did going back that's why when i'm doing my evaluation for this return on invested capital and return on equity i go with the professor who designed this template that yes goodwill is generally not included in invested capital or assumption that it is paid for growth assets that's why i go yes and remove goodwill and come up with my realistic return on invested capital but even through doing this my favorite uh, sig signal is return on invested capital is still way positive this is a performing company then i've looked at uh, the calculating the returns and how goodwill impacts that i haven't got into the other details i've also looked at the optimal uh, debt to equity ratio which the mood is carrying too much debt it is uh, covenants and whatever if things get real bad th those covenants can kick in and the company can be in trouble but i don't see them getting to s major major problems and they would have taken this because of the cost of debt being way too low i think they can f play their way around and uh, get out of this debt a little bit quicker than most companies here's the game plan they have about a billion in uh, cash and they, uh, with the, their book value of debt they will be almost off by about four billion give or take so they can manage this but it can get really bad and then now i go to the technical analysis i'll just look at the weekly chart i don't want to go to lots of details already there i'm seeing divergence from this point oh, let me just draw the lines this is the rsi it's going downwards at the same level the rsi is going up sorry the price is actually going up also from this perspective with that high and after that raised up there but sorry i want to use this high there there is the point there with up up but the price the rsi has been going down down so we have a clear divergence and also i have a mini grouping there of the technicals and my parabolic size is almost up there and we are almost going to kitchen send is flat and we have lots of tweaks there i have lots of my other indicators telling me this is turning down but this video is not more about uh, technical analysis today but i'm short i'm already short using options here because i expect this thing to go down on the 10 cars i'll do another video another time and 
my expectation is that we are going to come and bounce around here where the price true value is and also if all goes according to my view i think we are coming to the 130 zone i've used the long term options my idea of long term is options which are about six months to a year the structure which i've used is more like a a put ratio back spread but it's, it's tweaked a bit but that's what it is yeah my take is usually when you see the rsi being over sold stochastic oversold and we have some groupings of these ones at the bottom that's a buying zone so technically on this five year chart I t this is a buying zone one two three the sell zones are when these are grouped at the top there overbought over grouping and parabolics are flip over and tickets and crossed one two this was supposed to be three, but it did not cross the ticket sign, so we stayed there. We had three here, and on this one, yes, this was above, above, no nice grouping, and which not close below there. Then up we went, but now we are up there. We haven't crossed, yes, but we are almost there. This can happen in any of this coming week, but I've already triggered my position. If I just go move to the daily chart, the daily chart is consolidating there because the big shots are really taking their positions, trying to get out of this one, and the other one's trying to load to get out a, a short. I'll quickly move to the annual uh, uh, monthly chart. I know I'm not explaining my technical analysis, it's not the purpose for this video. You can clearly see the divergence there. That was high there. Where is RSI is heading downwards? Same positions. Price is heading up. And I expect it to come down there, but more like on the 140 zone there. I expect it to come down and find this support there where it found support previously. This would be my, pre my support line about 140. That's where I expect it in the long term to come down to. That's my take on uh, Moody's. Business model for Moody's is simple. They just do evaluations of companies and give date ratings. Yeah. And they have a monopoly on their business, but it's overbought currently. And I expect uh, something in the region of 30% or close there, a drop in the market price, then we can turn around again. That's my take. I've taken a position on this one. So key takeaways is try to establish the optimum ca debt to capital. Try to establish the correct return on capital. Not just from w picking it from website or funny calculations of uh, book value. We need the market one. Do a proper intrinsic evaluation and get a proper pricing of where you are. Then uh, look at your technicals, see how they behave. My value is slightly above where the technicals will be telling me. My value is 153. Technicals are saying we are likely to come to 140 using the monthly charts. That's me. I'm going to close this one. I hope you found some benefit. I've slotted this one on my journal I've uh, this was just me creating my journal but i hope what i've shared is worthwhile i'll be revisiting this uh, maybe on a monthly basis and whenever i decide it's time to make a major difference whether i'm turning around going long or i'm closing it and staying away but chances are i'll s stay on this one going down and when we hit the bottom i'll reverse my option structuring to start looking at benefiting going up. This is a chart, a stock which I intend to be in it for some time, around five years, and use lots of leverage of options to really benefit big. So long to Sanam PM Sebata. Bye bye.